welcome everybody to our webinar. So we've got a lot of material to get through today, so we're going to be fairly swift, but please put your questions in the chat as we're going along and we'll answer as many as we can uh, towards the end. So cybercrime is in the news a lot at the moment where there's a number of big notable breaches and um, events that have happened over the last even six months. And these statistics here uh, reflect that um, certainly in the last six months of last year, we've seen a, an uptick, uptick in the malicious or criminal attacks um, on organisations in Australia. And I think you know, the government is doing a number of things to try to improve the situation and part of it is is really to try to protect consumers and um, requiring businesses to really step up. Certainly there's reporting, but increasingly putting um, responsibility back to not only directors in organisations, but APRA now is also, as a an regulatory body, is pushing responsibility uh, into executives and senior leaders within an organisation from a responsibility for cyber protection and um, securing customers' data. So it's certainly something that has gone from um, a kind of fairly, you know, remote and a risk that didn't wouldn't impact people in their day-to-day -day jobs to something that is and should be at the forefront of everyone's mind. So part of what the um, the government has done is, you know, the Australian Signals Director has really has the mission of helping to secure um, businesses and and government around Australia from cyber threats. So, um, you know, critical infrastructure right through to to mum and dad's businesses can all get advice. And um, you know, really the this this organisation is is the recognised Australian based um, organisation, and they provide a number of uh, tools and research and things like that for for organisations. Uh, the Essential Eight framework is one of them. Um, the Information Security Manual and the Australian Cyber Security Centre is another, and so that provides a whole lot of threat insights and things like that that are very tailored to what they're seeing from an activity point of view in the Australian market, but obviously. Um, what you're also, you know, getting threat inputs from from overseas as well. So, what is the essential eight? So, I guess most people these days in in this line of work would have heard of the essential eight in some form. Um, essentially, it's a it's a framework and its strategies designed to mitigate cybersecurity incidents, and um, it's a framework that has been put out. Um, by ASD, and um, we'll, go, we'll go into a little bit more detail on what it means. But essentially, you know, the eight areas are really application control, so run, working out and controlling what can be run on your computer, making sure um, applications are patched and current, um, you know, being un, having your macros under control, and there's a number of things around that depending on the, the maturity level. Um, user application hardening. So if you've got PDF readers or other line of business or third party apps, making sure that they're configured properly, uh, rest restricting admin privileges to only when they needed by a very small number of people, uh, making sure your operating systems are patched, uh, user management and multi-factor and um, user validation and verification, and finally daily backups. So they're, they're the, um, the components. And they're really focused around three core areas. So the first four are around preventing attacks. So how do we stop people getting in? The next three are, okay, someone's got in. How do we stop them getting too far, elevating privileges, crossing into different parts of the business and things like that? And the final one is the, the recovery. So if it goes pear-shaped in a big way, can we get our data back and our business online? So has it been kept uh, in a manner that means that it is away from or out of reach of a breach to the main operational network and, you know, is it tested and does it work regularly? The key, uh, one of the key elements to the Essential 8 is it is a maturity model. So it's not something where we come on and you've got the Essential 8 or anything like that. Um, essentially, it's it starts of, if you haven't looked at anything in that particular area, you know, you're not aligned at all to it. If it's fully implemented and you're fully aligned, you're level three, which is the highest level of maturity. So really the, the level of implementation uh, depends on a lot of things and we'll go into that in a minute, but um, each, each maturity level has an increasing um, level of mitigation as far as um, adversary trade craft. So the tools and tactics and techniques that are needed to, to try and get around them are harder 
the more mature you are. And um, you know, each of the each of the strategy, each of the um, maturity levels are evaluated separately. And essentially, the level of maturity for an organisation is the lowest value achieved of all of the eight, because cybersecurity, as I'm sure you're all aware, is very much something that you're only as good as your your weakest link kind of thing. So a lot of organisations think that they need to get to level three. Um, and this brings around a whole lot of things. I think there's a huge underestimation of the effort um, of what's involved and um, things can get left out. So I, it's, a, it's a noble kind of um, intent to come in and say, look, we want to make our business as secure as we can. However, there's a whole lot of factors that start to come into play that make that sometimes a little bit harder than, than what everyone would like, because we all want to have the most secure business possible. But, um, you know, there are there are a number of things that come into play, like budget constraints, um, legacy technology, uh, organisation priorities, um, which is obviously tied closely to budgets. And, you know, these these changes and implementations of these controls aren't without impact on, on staff. And, um, you know, turning them on can in some cases be very easy, but it can radically restrict how people have worked if it's not set up and configured properly. So... There's a whole lot of reasons why it can be quite hard, but in saying that, you know, the part of what the government's doing is is trying to increase the reporting, and it's now a requirement for businesses with turnover over three million, they must report any kind of data breach, and part of um, part of that is that it, as part of the review, they're going to be looking at well, okay, you had a data breach, but what did you do to try to stop that or to mitigate that or to reduce the likelihood of it happening, and so. Um, you know, there's increasingly now uh, it is being mandated on on partner organisations to have a level of essential aid or at least to declare their level of essential aid because, you know, you're only as secure as your, your third party vendors and suppliers. And, um, you know, all, you know, the Australian government has mandated that all non-corporate Commonwealth entities also work to essential aid. So that'll flow through um, to their you know, their suppliers as well as part of that. So I will hand over to Andrew now, and he's going to dive into a little bit more detail about how do you how do you tackle um, the essential aid and how do you look at it from you know, a bit more of a risk-based point of view as opposed to just ticking the boxes. Thank you, Todd. So how do you identify and plan uh, what maturity level you're going to target for your organisation? So the best approach for that is through a risk management process. Now, risk management has a number of phases and steps and can be quite complex. But at the same time, if you follow the steps, uh, it's something that's easily achievable. So first of all, you need to identify your assets. Now, these are both physical information technology assets, such as networking devices, servers, uh, cloud services, software as a service, all those sorts of things, um, as well as information assets. Do you hold personally identifiable information about your customers? Uh, are you a financial institution and holding their financial records, for instance? Uh, those are also assets that require protection. Then you need to conduct a threat assessment. What are the threat actors that are going to be looking at your organization specifically? Now, most people would like to jump to things such as nation states. Um, however, there's also uh, organized crime. Um, petty criminals as well, um, together with people who may have some concern um, or issue with your organization um, and may be uh, interested in disrupting it. Uh, then you need to conduct a vulnerability assessment. Based upon those assets and the current way that they are implemented and protected, what are the vulnerabilities that they have and how best can you defend those, sorry, how can you identify what the vulnerabilities currently are so that you can then determine the impact if those vulnerabilities were to be uh, taken advantage of? Would there be a financial loss, reputational damage? Uh, would you lose sensitive data that would impact upon your business, um, like those assets we were talking about before? And how then can you determine the effectiveness of what you are currently doing? 
So by evaluating your current security controls, you can work out how well you're currently defending those assets and therefore what is your current residual risk. So what is the risk that's currently posed to those information assets that are being secured? And based upon that, what level of maturity of the essential eight should you be striving for? Um, and what other controls should be implemented? Once you've made essentially collected all of this information, it can all be collated together in a risk management plan that should be looking at both the essential eight and other controls that may uh, so mitigate the gaps that uh, you've identified through the earlier parts of the process. Once you've identified what you're going to be doing, you can then look at an implementation plan. Uh, how are you going to meet those requirements? How are you going to achieve uh, the maturity level that you've determined? And how are you going to implement that in your business to achieve the outcomes that you're looking for while minimizing other business risks? Once you've done all of that, um, then you need to understand that this requires monitoring or reviewing going forward uh, indefinitely. It's not something you can just do once. Uh, it's not set and forget. The threat landscape changes as well as threat actors change the way that they operate uh, and take actions to try and work around the mitigations that you've put in place. It's also really important that you test what has been put in place to ensure that it is effective uh, and that it has been implemented correctly. Uh, it's quite possible that humans may have made a mistake and therefore it's important that uh, you validate that those protections have been put in place. Now the, the thing to remember is that this is all about business risk. What is the risk to the business that is posed by these cybersecurity issues? It's not a case where uh, the IT department or the security team uh, want to implement their cool new tool. Uh, this is about how can the business protect itself and reduce the total risk posed to the business from these cybersecurity threats. And in order to do that, it requires commitment and support from senior management, be that the owner of the company, uh, the general manager, uh, members of the board. This needs to be coming from the top because otherwise, Implementing these controls can be hard. Um, it may restrict what staff can do. Uh, if you consider things such as application control, uh, it will take some time and it is complex and it may have impact upon the business. But as long as you have that uh, background in place, so this is being implemented to reduce business risk and it is a priority for the organization, um, then it's something that can be worked together with the entire company in order to achieve the outcomes that you're looking for. And it is important that you know, this is proactive, that everyone understands the underlying risk and threats that are being posed to the company, and this is why you're taking these steps, uh, and that they are done in accordance with that plan that has been uh, prepared and communica uh, communicated to those who are required to understand, so that way that that can all be supported. And as an outcome of following this process, you may then achieve compliance with the, the frameworks that you're looking for. Uh, in fact, one of the business risks that may be posed is uh, an inability to sell to government if you do not comply. Uh, but that is, compliance with Essential Aid is not the objective as much as in meeting those requirements for procurement. So it's very important that you know, even if you do tick all of these boxes, if you go through the essential eight and you see it as a recipe and you just do step one, step two, step three, uh, that's not going to meet the requirements that you have to be able to minimize the risks. There is more to it than that. Particularly because if you are going through it and trying to essentially rush to implement the essential eight because you are seeing it as a list of things to do, then you, you may have a number of other issues that come up. So if you're going to skip planning and risk assessment, then you may be implementing things uh, haphazardly, or you may, rather than implementing across the, broad, uh, across the board, all of the different controls uh, to some level, uh, you may instead determine that, you know, for instance, oh, we're going to implement to maturity level three in backups, uh, but we're not going to look at doing multi-factor authentication at all. Um, so that would be make it easy for you to recover from an attack, um, but it would make it more likely than an attack would occur in the first place. So it's important that there is a plan that it is looking at the risks posed. 
and taking those steps to minimize that as quickly as possible. And it's also important to understand that things such as staff training uh, are not included in the essential aid. There isn't a requirement to provide your staff with um, effective cybersecurity training, but at the same time, they're the, the last line of defense. Uh, they're the people who, if an email gets past all of your email filters, um, or if someone hands them a, a dodgy USB drive, uh, that human is the one who's going to be making that choice uh, that hopefully they'll make the secure choice. Um, we also talked earlier about testing, monitoring and updating. It's very important to keep this going forward, um, implementing uh, the latest best practice. For instance, if you implemented an antivirus a number of years ago, um, but haven't moved on to newer technologies such as EDR or XDR, then you may be a, a bit behind the eight ball on the current uh, possible protections. Now, if you were to do all these things, you'd end up um, in a position that is ineffective. So it may be haphazard, it may miss areas, therefore leading to uh, inadequate security that you think is meeting your requirements, uh, wasting time, resources and money. Then that is not a good position to be in because this is where uh, anyone who had a concern with the security uh, mitigations that are being put in place would be able to point to this and go, see, I told you so, this has impacted upon the business and not achieved a business outcome. This is why it's very important that there be a continuous communication about the risk management process and how these steps uh, will reduce that business risk. So as part of your risk management approach, it needs to be customized to you. It needs to align with what your company requires. Each company has a different um, level of risk acceptance, uh, different requirements they're trying to meet and a different threat landscape that faces them. Now, there are four different options when you've identified these risks. So accepting a risk is where the company has decided that this is something that whilst it is a risk posed to the company, uh, it is appropriate to accept the way it is currently. It may be that it has a low impact or it's incredibly unlikely um, or it would be too costly to be able to implement effective mitigating controls. Um, avoiding a risk would be where the organization chooses not to go into a particular area. For instance, if the organization has concerns with cloud systems, they may choose not to implement cloud-based products. Uh, or they may choose to, um, instead of implementing a, a point of sale system from one provider that they have concerns with, they may implement one from another. Mitigating is where you've implemented controls to prevent that risk occurring. So this is where things such as the Essential 8 framework would come in place, where you can implement those controls to be able to reduce that risk. And transferring is uh, essentially where you are taking that risk and the potential outcomes, and you're making it another organization's problem. So this is where things such as traditional insurance may come in um, or a managed services provider. Now, it's important to understand that while you can transfer some of the outcome, you can't transfer the responsibility. And it's also likely to have impact upon your organization if the issue occurs regardless for your um, for the organization even if for instance if you have a cyber attack and you do have cyber insurance and therefore are able to claim some kind of monetary amount that's still going to have a large impact on your business regardless and also today there's a lot of concerns around the ability of cyber insurance to pay uh, so there may be other issues there too. So it's important that the organization focuses on how best can you reduce actual risks rather than just meeting those regulatory requirements. And that needs to be tailored to you and it needs to consider all aspects of the organization's cybersecurity uh, position, like the people, processes and technologies involved. And it needs to be integrated with all of those things together. So that way there isn't uh, where you're missing steps or you're missing areas of the business and what it does. Uh, you need to be continuously improving and making uh, strides to make the program more effective. Uh, effective in this case could mean that there's better mitigating controls, but it could also be looking at reducing the cost involved in implementing them. And it needs to be flexible to meet uh, the, the needs of your organization, how you can reduce your risks and under your budget. So how do you do that? 
Um, so you need to embed cybersecurity inside your business risk management framework. Now, one thing to think about is that at the moment, your organization certainly controls physical security risks. So physical security risks are mitigated in a number of ways. For instance, through the use of fencing, uh, implementing walls, having doors, windows that are locked, alarm systems, security guards. Now, if you think about all of those things, they are reducing the risk of a physical security attack. But at the same time, if you wanted to, uh, you could expend a lot of effort on your physical security. For instance, the front door, instead of being made out of wood, could be made out of steel. Um, instead of having a, a fence that is four feet tall, you could have a fence that is you know, 10 feet tall. Uh, you could have a armed security guard out the front. You could have guard dogs. You could have cameras. You could implement a lot of additional things. And if you consider the essential eight and the maturity levels, if you're going to go all the way to maturity level three, um, and that's not aligned with the risk that is posed to your company, then that's essentially the same as posting a armed guard at the front of your fish and chip shop. It, it may not be necessary, and it certainly uh, would be a, an excellent way to spend a lot of money. So therefore, it's important that you know cybersecurity risk is managed the same as all other business risks, uh, and that it's included in that standard business risk management. And that the goal of the organization should be around how can we reduce business risk in total, and cybersecurity is one of those areas there. And it needs to also be focused on building the appropriate controls for the worst vulnerabilities, the most likely to impact in the uh, largest impact upon the business, um, rather than things that are incredibly unlikely or going to have a small impact. So a number of areas are often overlooked when implementing a cybersecurity program. So those might be IoT devices, such as internet connected systems, such as lifts, photocopiers, or phone systems, uh, where you know patching the operating system that runs your lift uh, may be something you've never even thought of. Um, however, there are other controls that you could implement, such as a uh, segregated network, um, or potentially not connecting the lift to the network at all. Uh, if you consider phone systems, there's been a, a recent issue with uh, Cisco uh, analog telephone adapters, um, where they're end of life, but they they could be sitting under your desk at the moment making your VoIP phone work. And if instead of, for instance, making that part of your patching regime, you're instead segregating those so that they cannot be connected to from other things or untrusted devices or implementing other controls, you may be able to make the assertion that you have now reduced that risk posed to your business um, to an acceptable level. Uh, when you consider third party and outsourced service providers, uh, they are a potential risk that has come up uh, multiple times in the past for organizations, and it's something that can be very difficult to manage. And that's where you need to engage with them to understand what their cybersecurity program is and how they're going to defend uh, your data and your organization's other assets. And if you consider things such as test environments, testing and monitoring of your existing security controls, uh, test environments, whilst they're often left as a place for developers uh, to be able to implement new things, try out new areas. If, for instance, you were to leave a, an API less protected than you would expect, or if you're copying your production data into a test environment that doesn't have standard security controls, that may be a vector for an attack. Now, you may consider that an attack upon your test environment is less impactful than one upon production, but if you have copied that data over, or you do have resources available either on servers or on cloud infrastructure, that's where a adversary can impact upon you by, for instance, mining cryptocurrency, um, using the, the storage to store mali um, malicious or other materials. So even though it is just your test environment, it could be equally impactful upon your organization. So it's very important that that is part of your ongoing maintenance. Uh, so I'll now hand back over to Todd and he can continue with the slides. Thank you, Andrew. So one of the, um, you know, it's very much at, at the forefront of everyone's mind. You know, the ASIC chairman has come out and said that, you know, cyber resilience has to is has got to be the number one risk facing everyone. And 
um, I see it as the top of the house, the board of directors level issue. So it is really important for organisations and I think it can't actually be underestimated because the consequences of a cyber breach can can destroy businesses, um, you know, particularly B2C businesses that are so heavily dependent on their reputation and things like that. And, you know, we're starting to see civil cases come into, into play here. And so I think the, you know, the key takeaways that we've got uh, out of today's presentation really, you know, it is the number one risk. So 10 years ago, Cyborg didn't even make the top 10. You know, we've got Allianz, there's a number of other insurance things that that come out and are saying it is the number one risk respecting businesses, um, affecting businesses, sorry. Uh, everyone should be worried about, about it. Um, as appropriate and and security has to ultimately be a whole of organization concern as well so right from you know the people at the front desk through to the IT teams you know social engineering is one of the key key approaches to breaches so everyone in an organization organization needs to be trained needs to have security at the forefront of their mind um, essential aid is a tool it's a framework it's it's part of the the solution and it, but it's really important not to just use it as a tick box exercise instead looking at the risks making sure that the risks are aligned with your business and what you can afford to do and what you need to do based on the kind of threats you're going to have and then look at you know how you then once those risks are, are understood you know what do you do about them you know some you can you know avoid you know Andrew mentioned avoid transfer mitigate accept um, and they're all important. And the key thing here is understanding what you're up against, um, understanding so people can make educated decisions. And the final point is doing nothing is not an option. And, um, you know, there's so many reasons today why it, it is, is not an option, um, you know, from legal right through to reputational and business continuity. So thank you all for attending. Um, you know, we do have, we're going to questions in a minute, but I guess um, we've got a bit of an offer for, for people today. So I think we're, we're looking at the first five or so um, people that register. We will um, provide them, you know, with a with a free two-hour webinar of, of where to start on your journey. Um, that'll include, you know, discussions around the Essential Eight and helping understand how they, they fit in and, and really where, you, you know, your organisation should be should be targeting from a maturity level for each of the the um the items that we've discussed and and kind of just help you on your journey so feel free to scan that or enter the the link below um if you don't want to scan random qr codes it's perfectly reasonable thing to do but um we will also send the link out in an email so i think rachel uh over to you have we got any any questions at the moment Thanks, Todd and Andrew. That was great and um, great segue into our first question. Where do I start on my journey? Maybe scan the QR code, but um, Todd or Andrew? Yeah, I think I don't know when that question came up, but I think certainly it's really about just understanding where where you're at uh, on your journey and what kind of business you are, whether your primary customers are consumers, whether they're businesses. It's just about, you know, it's understanding where where you're at, what are your risks, and um, you know, then starting to apply the essential eight. Um, you know, these days a lot of organizations have rolled out things like the Microsoft, Microsoft 365 and, and tools like that. So there are a lot of things that are we, we often find un, untapped and unused uh, in those that people are paying for. And so, you know, after going through that kind of risk based approach, there's often are a lot of quick wins that with a bit of user training can can radically increase the maturity level in a few key areas. So where to start really just comes back to, you know, where, where you're at and what what problem you're trying to solve and the risks faced by your business. Okay. So another question, um, if we had to choose one of the essential eight, and I'm assuming they're referring to the strategies, um, which one should we choose? Maybe Andrew, would you like to have a go at that one? I guess uh, when you look at the, the essential eight changes over time, uh, the current version of the level one maturity for each of the, the controls is something that can be achievable with uh, limited additional tooling. 
and certainly the the story that I guess what we're trying to convey is that uh, if you go all in on just one control, you're leaving yourself open to a number of other areas. So, for instance, application control uh, allows you to be of a, a fairly strong level of understanding that there's unlikely to be, for instance, malware executed on your system. Um, if you haven't implemented something like multi-factor authentication, then you're leaving your organization open to credential theft, um, usernames and passwords, and then used to take advantage of that user's access to your systems. So the, the, the main thing to consider is that having some level of um, protection across all of those spaces uh, would certainly be the best way to go. Uh, if you're choosing which one to start with, um, there's a, a fortnightly uh, threat briefing from the ACSC, uh, and every single threat briefing starts with, you need to implement MFA if you have not implemented MFA. Uh, so certainly that would be a starting place. Um, and then looking at how best can you, um, I guess, uplift quickly um, across the other areas. Okay. Um, I guess that also can lead into, I think this is more of a generalised across a security uplift, but what's your opinion on the hardest aspect of a security approach, an uplift approach for a business to do? I guess I'm happy so, to take that one as well. Um, although yeah, I think so I can, can guess yeah. what Todd's about to say anyway. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> one of the, uh, the controls talks about macros. Um, and organizations that have been around for a, a certain period of time tend to have uh, incredibly complicated uh, spreadsheets um, or Word documents that are full of macros. Um, and they may be essential for the operation of the business, but at the same time, um, malicious documents with macros in them uh, can allow an attacker to take whatever actions they would like. Um, so implementing some kind of macro control, uh, preventing the execution of unsigned macros can be uh, quite difficult and complex to do, but at the same time, very important. Uh, it's also another example of where taking other mitigations uh, may be appropriate, such as blocking them in your perimeter firewalls or email gateways. Um, but certainly that one can be hard to do. Did you have yeah, something else that, you want to add? Yeah, no, so, I'll, I'll add to that. I think one of the key elements that's not an explicit essential aid control is really uh, training of staff. And, um, you know, from from everyone across the organisation who touches the computer needs to needs to understand, you know, if an email comes through, what do I do? You know, what are the consequences? Um, you know, the security starts at, at, you know, at every point of the business, there is no no one who is, you know, doing a role that doesn't need to be secure and doesn't need to be trained. And so I think, you know, that is something that is often overlooked and is critical from, you know, really just increasing that whole security awareness and security posture and, um, you know, communication with staff and getting them to understand and believe in in what we're trying to what you're trying to do as an organisation as far as security goes is really important. Okay, um, change of tact. Do you think insurance is a valid mitigation of risk? Well, I think um, insurance is an interesting question because we do actually, we find this a little bit when we're talking to our customers and insurance, you know, it can provide some, um, some mitigation, but at the end of the day, um, what we're finding and what we know from firsthand from us filling out our cyber insurance thing is you know what you have to attest to that you're doing to prevent cyber risk um, is quite significant and if you can't kind of roll out something like an essential eight or some kind of demonstration that you're not doing nothing um, you know, often you won't even get considered. It's not even that it's very expensive. They just uh, insurance organisations will just deem it too too much of a risk. And so, um, yes, I think it is absolutely, and it can be part of kind of the portfolio of things that are, um, you know, required to help an organisation. But I don't think it can 
be done in replacement of any kind of things like you know multi-factor and 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 um, other items contained in the essential eight framework. So important, but you're not going to talk about not worth it without doing the other things. Particularly okay. because uh, insurance will not uh, save you from the reputational damage. Uh, if you're a, a financial institution or you know any any organization and you have a cyber attack and a data breach, then that is going to impact upon your customer's opinion of you, uh, and they may choose to go to someone else. So even though you may be able to claim millions of dollars from your insurance provider, that's not necessarily going to make up for that reputational damage. Okay. Another question here. Are the timelines defined in the essential eight? So for example, patching of the operating system and applications to be customized to the business requirement. I'll let Anne answer this one because this is an issue that's very near and dear to his heart. <laughs> yes, I'm a big fan of patching things and patching them quickly. Um, the, the timelines that are defined are based upon what the uh, ACSC and other organizations have seen um, as the, the likely time period it would take for a threat to be able to take advantage of it. Uh, so if you consider today, today's Patch Tuesday, even though it's it's a Wednesday, um, and there's three new critical vulnerabilities that have been, uh, I guess, patched and notified by Microsoft today. So today would be the first day that you could apply that patch. Um, one of those vulnerabilities comes via email. Um, so potentially that is already something that um, a threat actor is attempting to use against your organization now as you're in this webinar. So if you consider how long you would like to wait between today and when you're implementing the patch, um, certainly there are a number of other business risks, risks in applying the patch too quickly. Um, in the past, there have been patches that have broken functionality um, or impacted upon other business uh, operations. So you may not want to apply the patch immediately, um, but at the same time, a, a yearly patch cycle, for instance, uh, would likely be seen as negligent today. So you as an organization need to take that risk uh, management approach and un understand that you're making a choice as to how often you're going to apply those patches. Um, are you going to apply them, you know, three days after the release by Microsoft, uh, two weeks, a month? Um, that needs to be an active choice um, and something that is automated as part of your patch management system. So the, the timelines that are defined are certainly the best practice and the recommendation, um, but it needs to be part of your risk management process. Yeah, and I guess I'll just add to that. It it does depend on on the systems. As Andrew said, there'll be some systems that might need more testing before a patch goes out, and there's others that you can can and probably should push out. Um, you know, there are some pretty aggressive recommendations around, you know, certainly critical vulnerabilities being rolled out within inside 48 hours. But you know, like everything, it has to, you know, it has to be kind of catered for in your your risk management approach to security particularly things that are connected to the internet. That was the last of our questions and we're almost at time. Um, Todd and Andrew, do you want to just go to the, oh, first of all, everyone, just a reminder, please, you know, if you, if you want an obligation complimentary chat, please follow the link, um, just provide us a few details and we'll be in contact with you. Um, and maybe if we go to the next slide, please. Um, and if you need to get in contact with us in general, there's a phone number there and the inquiries email at Canon Business Services. Um, and please do reach out. We're more than happy to have a chat with you. And thank you everybody for your time today on this important topic um, and thank you to Todd and Andrew and uh, thank you very much and we'll say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you everyone.
Mm-hmm. 